I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Noreen Nee Viun. Noreen is an Irish spiritual singer, theologian, teacher, author, and interfaith minister. She received the first PhD in theology at the University of Limerick. Known as the high priestess and expert of Gregorian chant, she is also known as a singer of Celtic music, Shanos, and Indian songs. Noreen has released 16 albums since 1978, including three with her sons. Her voice has rung out for peace on many continents, from United Nations conferences to gatherings with the Dalai Lama. You had stage fright for a period. You've been singing since you were the mere age of seven. And I'm wondering what shifted that? How did you come out of stage fright? And yeah, do you attribute that to anything in particular? And Olivia, do, do you ever come out of stage fright? <laughs> Even now I'm here <clears throat> sort of praying for inspiration and all of that. Yeah. But I think probably two things. And the most dramatic of that is knowing that your singing is not coming from yourself. That So you have to remove, you have to shift the ego there. And that took me a long time to shift because, of course, I started singing when I was very young and I was a sort of child prodigy. I presented ra- the first radio programs, children's radio programs in Ireland, all of that kind of stuff. And thrown onto the stage, won all sorts of competitions. And so... I ended up very precocious as a young girl until I had a very traumatic experience at the age of 14 when I was told, you know, in fact, you're not as good or as, you know, talented as you think you are, because I made a mistake one time in a little musical Mm -hmm. that I was playing the part in. So then my ego suddenly came in and I suddenly realized, oh, gosh, You know, I'm imperfect. And so it took me so long to learn that, in fact, your talent is nothing about you. It's coming at you from another source entirely. And that each time so, even including today, that I do something to do with my singing or with communication, I pray and pray that my ego will turn from the small e, the small ego, into what Carl Jung called the self with a capital S. And so he would expand on that capital S being the imago dei, the image of the divine. And that each one of us, that's our vocation, that is our job, is to be that messenger and to stand back from yourself. And then the other message that I learned too at that time when I was going through crippling stage fright, which now I don't have, it's not crippling now so much so that it takes away my voice, but was that a priest one time in the monastery where I lived for 16 years in the male monastery in Ireland, he once said to me, look at said, you're singing. This evening, I was talking about a concert I was going to be doing locally for about 300 people. And he said, look what you're singing there for one person and one person only. And if you reach that person, your job has been done. And I find that so helpful, Olivia, in that here are we speaking to your group of friends and listeners But there's really only one person there that will be deeply, deeply touched by something you and I will say. And so I often experience that at concerts, Olivia, you know, you've suddenly done your bit. And of course, most of my concerts now will be in church because my repertoire is spiritual. And so but you'll be there and you'll catch somebody's eyes at the end of a concert. And you might never meet them. Sometimes, of course, people will come up to you. But you'll know that was the person I was here for. So they're the two things that really have helped me live with nervousness. Because nervousness is my friend. 
and mm-hmm. I can never, like the poor, it's always with us, and I can never get rid of that. You mentioned living in the monastery for all of those years. First of all, how that came to be, but also what your lifestyle was like living in the monastery all those years and, and what parts of that you've kind of brought forth into your lifestyle now. Oh, Olivia, have you three days? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. So to give you just a little potted version of that, of course, I grew up quite near that monastery as a child. And as a child, I really had no friends when I was a troubled child. But I always found myself at home when I would cycle to this monastery. And it had nothing to do, really. Their Benedictine male monastery, the only Benedictine monastery in Ireland, Glenstone Abbey. And so it had nothing to do with the monks there because I didn't know them. But it was that soil there. Of course, that's the beautiful thing about Ireland, Olivia, is that the soil speaks to you because every inch of the way is a sacred site or something happened there thousands of years ago. And so, too, in this space of Glenstall Abbey, I always felt at home there. And then I got married and had two sons. Marriage began to crumble at a certain stage, but a crumbling that we welcomed both. My <clears throat> former husband, somebody in America was telling me, talking about their their former husband, and they were calling them a wasband. I thought it was a very clever term I'd never <laughs> heard. But so when things started to, when we realised that we really should, we were holding each other back and we should go our separate ways, but yet we maintain our friendship and indeed our love. Actually, Olivia, he passed over in 2018 and right to that last moment, friends, I'm an interfaith minister and Michal came to my ordination in 2018, a few months before he died. And indeed, I sang at his wedding a month later. So we remained very friendly, which is something that I'm very interested in now, actually, particularly since I took up the ministry, Olivia. How do you bless a separation? How do you bless a divorce? That's another whole story. I'd love to get into that. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's very important, actually. We know how to bless weddings and love and friendship but when it moves on to a different stage how do we create a ritual for that it allows us to remain if we can at all at all friendly and proceed in the knowledge that we were together for a particular reason because everything happens for a reason so then to go back to the monastery so when my when we were beginning to separate, I was also embarking on a course of a doctorate in theology. And so I applied to the monastery for a hermitage to complete that monastery. And it was such a blessing, Olivia, at the time, because it allowed me to retreat from the world. But also I had this marvellous library of 70,000 theological books so I would get a reference and in three minutes I would have the book in my hand. And then, of course, many of the monks were experts on very various aspects of theology. So I was like a traveller or, you know, there's somebody who I said, I, I just need your help now. And so they did give me hermitage for that three years and that proved to work out very well. And so I would attend morning office, which was at 6.35 a.m. right through the day up to night prayer, Compline, at 8.35. And it was a blessed time. But of course, Olivia, this is a male Roman Catholic monastery. So the monks are up there on their pews, and I'm down here very often on my own in the body of the church. So all of that kept me very happy for a good few years. And then... And A.S. Nin, a French writer, she has a lovely saying. She says, the time came when to remain in the bud was more painful than to blossom. So that time came when the monastery didn't really serve me anymore. When Roman Catholicism, I needed something broader. 
some broader voice. And of course, my doctorate was on listening to the sound of God. Now, that was in a Christian context. But then I began to realize that the sound of God is everywhere. We all call it different names. Eight billion people on this planet. And we'll have, each of us will have a different name and indeed no name for what we call that spirit that has brought us together. Look at this Zoom, for God's sake, has to be created by some outside force um, for some reason. Um, so I lived there until 2016. And then I had started embarking on a course of interface ministry in London, in a seminary in London. And so I knew I was facing, you know, it would be very difficult for the monks to have this woman ordained, so-called ordained. Um, so miraculously, I moved. But having said that, I'm still at the gate, Olivia, and I hope you'll visit me someday there of the monastery so I can hear the bells and I can go come and go as I please there. And I'll always be connected to Linstall Abbey. But just, it was just a time kept so much riches and treasures from that time, particularly reciting the Psalms, Psalms, I think he would say, is, we'd say Psalms. So, because that was, of course, the daily round of the monastery. And so I loved and still do love saying the Psalms mm. daily because the Psalmists, they're just people like you and I who were wounded and in search of the divine, in search of a lifeline to hope with this valley of tears and of love. And of course, most of the Psalms, of course, as you know, are centered around love. Some of them around a lack of love, too. But that's another story. Do there any that come to mind? My favorite one is, and I'll sing it for you, I'll just give you a little blast of it, is 120 in some in the Hebrew New Ring, it'll be 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains, from where shall come my help? My help shall come from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. May God never allow you to stumble. May God sleep not your God. God sleeps not nor slumbers, it's Rhea's God, all of our God. The Lord is your God and your shade, at your right hand God stands. By day the sun shall not smite you, nor the moon in the night. The Lord will guard you from evil, God will guard your soul. God will guard your going and your coming, both now and forever. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. And I feel like this is a good segue into a Gregorian chant. What is a Gregorian chant? And also, it's known for its healing offerings. Curious if you would speak to both of these. Taking from St. Gregory, because that's, it's a misnomer, really. But it's the chant of the Christian tradition, and so very much based on a, a Latin version of the Psalms. And so it would be sung primarily by monasteries. The daily round would have these little chants, some beautiful songs. Ave Maria! That chant to the Divine Feminine, to Mother Mary. And so some beautiful, beautiful chants, all, you know, anonymous, of course. We don't really know who wrote the body of chant that goes back to the 10th century. One of the oldest chants, it, they say, goes back to the 6th century, which is where charity and love is true. God is there. O where charity and love is true, God is there. So, of course, chanting then too, Olivia, in all traditions is extremely healing and a great way of connection with the divine, whatever we'll call that divine, the white spirit, the almighty, 
whatever. So in most religions will be centered around chanting, as you know, the Buddhist too, they will chant for hours on end, the Hindu tradition as well too. And so it's re recognizing that power of moving something from speech into song. That a huge transformation happens there when you go from this speech on to chanting. Going back to your, your thesis, or your paper for your doctorate degree, the title was The Specificity of Christian Theosony. And I think it's important we actually just mention this word because it's attributed to you, theos, from the Greek theos, God, and the Latin sona, sounding, referring to the practice of listening to the divine. And this could also be like a three-day answer, but what were some essential conclusions on how and why these vocal sounds invite in, in holy experiences? Mm. Yeah, it's a very deep question too, indeed. So you see, in theology, and maybe in spirituality generally, I think the ear has been neglected. It's the Cinderella of the senses. You know, we, when we understand something, we say, I see, not I hear. And for me, connection with the divine since I was a very young girl has always been aural. And every sound can bring you in to an ecstatic experience, can bring you into a moment, ecstatic, lo lovely word, of course, Greek word from ecstasis, from the exit, from what is, what is stuck, what is stagnant. So sound, I, I discovered it very early on as a young girl, was my medium. Not sight, but just that sound, every sound was, you could attribute since the creator, the divine, made the world, that every sound is also a vehicle, a vehicle to bring us into the sound of God. Um, and so that was the two words, chaos, as you have, as you said, Olivia, from God, Greek God and Latin sonans. And so went back, of course, to scriptures, but primarily Christian scriptures, Isaiah, listen that you might live, and found that there were these messages, these messages encrypted in the oral, and of course the oral too, and then of course very much part of my, of my doctorate too, Olivia was silence, and I think that's a huge area that we have to face in ourselves today, because we're moving away from stillness, from being silent. You know, our major problem is not being able to sit still, to meditate, to be in that silence. And then I always love to point out that silent, if you throw down those words on a scrabble table differently, you'll get listen. And then, of course, when I went to live in the monastery, the Benedictine monastery, I became very much involved in studying the rule of St. Benedict. There's a rule from the 5th century, Olivia, that monks live by. And it has an awful lot to say to us too. But the very first word that St. Benedict uses in that prologue to the, his monks, to the rule, the very first word is ausculta, Latin word was written in Latin, ausculta, which means listen with the ear of the heart. And so I was trying to delve into what is the ear of the heart? You know, we talk about the third eye, but what is the third ear? And so I devised a whole classification then of listening. How do you actually listen? How, what is the stage that brings you into the presence of the divine? And so I devised their cosmic theosne, which is listening to the sounds all around us. I'm listening to the birds now. I'm listening to my little grandson out here. But it's listening to that sound all around us. And then you have the sound that brings a message. So I suppose language you will put into that, where you are actually taking the sound and making sense of it. And then you have the final one, which I termed as a sort of an oxymoron, silent theosophy, which is where 
just listening, the act, the very act of listening brings you into the presence of the divine. Of course, this, all these ideas, though, Livia, are not new at all. I wasn't creating them. These are ever ancient, ever new, you know. But just it was a time, really, I was very inspired, of course, around that time by the philosopher and great friend of mine, John O'Donoghue. He read my thesis three times before he passed over in 2008. And so he, he was very instrumental in my in my research. Mm. Do you have any stories with John O'Donoghue that, that feel prominent in your mind or heart right now? Oh, sure, there are millions of them. Because, <laughs> well, the first, I didn't ever know John until Sounds True in Boulder, Colorado. And they invited me to accompany John when Anam Kara was published in 1999. And the two accompany him on a tour, well, it's more a pilgrimage, really, of the States for two weeks. A very, very risky thing because we mightn't have got on at all, at all, Olivia. But we met in the Gayerish Hotel in the Intercontinental in New York for the first time. And of course, we're two Irish speakers. We're two fluent Irish speakers. So we spoke Irish all the time. And But from day one, as they say, we just got on very, very well. And that two weeks of traveling with him in the States Oh, it was very special. That's, in fact, when the seeds of my doctorate were sown, because we had long, long journeys together, you see, and I would be t- telling him my ideas. And he said, that's a good idea. It's of anava eshin. That's in Irish. Or our of ma eshin necher. So I tried out a lot of ideas on him at that stage. And then when we came back, we kept in contact. We did recordings together and so on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so there isn't a day I, I don't miss John. He left us mm-hmm. so rapidly. But then, of course, he left us the great legacy of his writings and his presence. I can feel him here, actually, as I speak. Mm-hmm. What a tremendous gift to have had that synchronistic meeting. Well, going back into this Theosony, you also share this turning point. I think it's around the time you you had this divorce I guess this divorce blessing and and then also writing your doctorate and things seemed to shift for you where you started to not maybe put so much energy towards worrying and you started to really start to have greater faith and in, in what's bigger than you. You quoted once the Jewish proverb, humanity plans, God laughs. And I'm wondering because, you know, our culture is so material prominent right now, and it can feel, especially when the form world is not cooperating with what our mind would like, what do you feel is a, a pathway to nurture having greater faith in the unseen mm. and in the larger, the vision of one's life? Yes, and that's quite pertinent in my own life at this moment, actually, Olivia, that because I've come out of a very serious illness through an attack of shingles on my left side of my face, my eye, which led to death levels of sodium. And so it's just exactly four months ago now. And that has been a huge learning lesson on all of that, because up to now, I'd always thought I could manage my life, that I was in charge. Like a lot of us think that we are in charge. But then I knew this was a message from the divine. There's no other way I can talk to you, Noreen. You're a stubborn woman. I have to hit you with something very serious because I have messages to tell you. And so my life has turned around, Olivia, since then. All around patience. I think we're not taught how to be patient. That we have to go through the depths, the dark night of the soul to and be patient while we're doing it, knowing that we're being held. And even though I was on death's door and all sorts of emergency hospitals and so on, there were times that I did say, Why have you abandoned me? But there were other times that I knew deep down 
that I had to learn from this experience. I was being taught by being brought on my knees, quite literally. And so there were things I had to let go in my life. There were forms, ways of living habits I had to overcome. And I wouldn't have overcome them any other way except through this dramatic intervention, as it were. Because I had been teaching, doing ministry, writing, just finished a book on prayer and really had never been ill in my life. And suddenly to be brought to the point that wake up, wake up. A great message, of course, in scripture too, isn't it? Our lovely poet, Seamus Heaney, passed over. He used to say, he has a poem around, had I not been awake, I would have missed it. Had I not been awake, I would have missed it. And so that's a great message too for us in life. So I've digressed now from your... No, you totally not digressed. I'm sorry, first of all, that you had that experience, but it sounds like sorry wouldn't it be appropriate because you're seeing it as a gift. So I'm sorry, though, still for the suffering of it, and I'm glad you've come through. I'm wondering if all the years of trusting, because you've had a lot of twists and turns, it sounds like you've chosen to turn your mind towards having faith that there's a larger message of what it is to be a part of the great vastness. And I'm wondering too, going back to the listening to the divine, what do you find in in your regular life of how you keep turning your mind towards that wisdom, towards being okay with the intensity of the divine too, the chaos of the divine? You see, I wonder in life, certainly I think in my own life, do we make those choices? We look back. I look back, but I don't see them as I, there wasn't a particular time that I said, I'm going to do a doctorate. I'm going to go ministry. I'm going to, you know, I think you are guided in this rather than actually making that life choice yourself. There's very few life choices, I think, that we actually make, that we stumble very much into our lifestyles too. And we sort of trust that they will, you know, when we look back, we talk about mistakes. But I wonder, are there mistakes? You know, yes, when I look back in my life, I see all the things I shouldn't have done, the things I shouldn't have said. Hopefully not too many people I hurt. But I thought I was doing the best at that time. You know, do we, do we ever make a choice to do wrong. Mm. We do it because we thought it was the right thing to do at the time. It's a big question, you know, Mm -hmm. because I'm very affected by the golden rule, Olivia, because there are what? There are 4,200 religions in the world which believe that. 4,200. And each of them has their own version of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Some of them would be negative. Do not do unto others what you would not have them do to you. But all those major religions, the eight major religions and the more that break up into those 4,200, they all, and I wonder if we could only live by that love others as we'd like to be loved ourselves. Or indeed, as our Christian scriptures would say, love your neighbour as yourself. I remember one time I was invited by the United Nations to introduce His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Costa Rica. And it was a marvellous honour because I was bringing him in to this cathedral in San Jose and marching him up the aisle there 
And of course, I'd be singing lots. He didn't know, but I'd be singing lots of Christian stuff and Irish stuff and everything. And a few Tibetan chants too. But I got a chance to sit at his feet for a week there and to listen to his wisdom. He used to always say that, you Christians, you Christians, you will talk about love your neighbours as yourself. Poor neighbours, he'd say. You know. And it's true because we don't really know how to love ourselves. We're never taught to love ourselves. At least people of my generation in Ireland were never taught. We were always taught that you should be seen and not heard. So to love your neighbour as yourself, we first of all have to learn to love ourselves. And it's the measure of how much we love ourselves that we can love others. So loving begins at home, mm. begins in ourselves. What do you feel are some qualities of loving oneself? Hard question to answer. I suppose being good to yourself, as, or as John would say, minding yourself. Knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to, even more important. Surrounding yourself with like-minded people too, who bring the best out in you, not the worst. Selecting that, as Emily Dickinson would say, the soul selects her own society. Communing, being out in nature, looking at the tree, at a tree as a symbol of yourself. Reaching to the sky, reaching down into the depths. Accepting, of course, the darkness in ourselves. And not pushing it under the carpet or ignoring it, but recognizing it, welcoming in that dark side, mm. not driving it away. Loving ourselves, finding a connection with the spiritual, whatever that will be. Mm. Listening to poetry, music, singing a song, anything being creative. Of course, is loving yourself too. Being creative. And of course, doing things for other people too. I know you have great reverence with the elemental world. And I think of Ireland and there's a long line in, in Ireland of great kinship and reciprocity with the elemental world and the unseen. And I also know that you're a, a Celtic storyteller. And I wonder if you have any stories offhand that reflect this connection with the elemental world as living, as something to turn to in an honoring way. Myriads of thoughts come to my mind. Like our definition of nature would really be Tach Day, the house that God is to be seen in every element of nature. And many, many legends around that. One of our great gods is Angus, the god of love, actually, our equivalent to Eros. And the he is the god of love, was also the god of unrequited love. Those, those two sides there. But many legends around nature. There's another one flying through my head now that I wanted to share with you. There's Angus. There's Fionn McCool, of course, our great warrior, mythological figure. And once he was asked by his warriors, by his soldiers, they said, Fionn, what is your favourite music? Is it the music of the roaring of the sea? Is it the songs of the birds? Is it the breeze through the trees? Is it the sound of stones speaking to one another? 
What is it, Fionn, that is your favourite music? And he replied, he said, my favourite music is the music of what happens. My favourite music is the music of what happens. And so that is the music of everything, not just in nature, but the music of every moment that we, every day, gives us these moments. But of course, we our hearing is dulled with all the distractions around us. So we don't have that. We find it very hard to pick out even one moment in the day, not to talk of the thousands of moments that are there. But there's something else there. Yes, too. And that's, yes, about loving yourself. Actually, that's still question is still going through my mind, um, Olivia. The other thing is gratitude. That's one great way of loving ourselves is to look around and to see what can you be grateful for. Existence, friendship, family, and so on. Circling around to your work as an interfaith minister, your work is really to be with people during these transitory moments, whether we're speaking of a marriage or a divorce blessing or grief, loss of a loved one. And I wonder through this time, what is it for you that you find within yourself? How do you meet each of those experiences in the way that you know will serve those people in the most true beneficial way for them? I'm wondering how you meet those people that you have the gift of being with during those big moments of transition. Yeah, and it is a great privilege and a great honor. So that's the first thing, is the gratitude, again, for that privilege of standing beside people. And that gratitude, of course, carries a huge responsibility. And so that connects to the other side of it, which is preparation. And so I would prepare very much by praying, by withdrawing, and by praying that I will be gifted, which has nothing to do with me, but that I will be just gifted with the right words to say, because there are no scripts for this. At least I don't use any scripts. And so each couple, each passing over, each baby, each naming ceremony, each divorce, you see, ritual is so important to be able to ritualize something, to concretize it. Now that our churches have crumbled, our institutions thankfully have crumbled, we're now in a very exciting time, particularly in Ireland, where everything new can now be acknowledged. Of course, we were the first country in the world to recognize same-sex marriages. And I'd say 50% of my weddings would be same-sex marriages. You have to be a vessel for what is to come. You have to be a conduit, almost like an icon. You can see an icon around here, but an icon where not the image that is sacred in itself, but it is the belief that it leads you into. So I always see us ministers as simply the glue enabling people to move on, to celebrate their togetherness, to celebrate their love. And so it is that, and but also the other thing too that you're reminding me of now that I haven't spoken of before, Olivia, and that is the sense of community that it creates. When you're standing there with people, you really feel solidarity, either in allowing the person to pass over or in celebrating relationship, you know? And we have wonderful proverbs in Ireland that say that this is an age-old experience. One is Er sca a chéile a varin mudrine Er sca a chéile a varin mudrine And that is that in the shadow and in the shelter sca is an Irish word which is shadow and shelter that in that we exist and so are that we live when we are in the shadow and the shade of each other. <laughs>